This is our last program in the series on what the government and private intelligence organizations are doing around the world. This is Lewis Wolf, co-editor of Covert Action Information Bulletin, which specializes in revealing what these organizations are doing. Our other guest is John Stockwell, who was with the CIA for many years, had a high position in the organization, actually ran their Angolan operation, and quit, wrote the book In Search of Enemies, subsequently a new novel, Red Sunset. Tonight we'll discuss particularly the CIA in Latin America and the total ramification on how this fits in to the United States foreign policy and the ramifications overseas. Now let's have some news. Everybody knows there's unemployment, but the cost to the American people, to individuals, as well as the economy and the social fabric of the nation is staggering. For instance, each 1% increment of unemployment diminishes the gross national product by about 68 billion. These are 1980 estimates. A lot of studies now are being made by sociologists and economists of the impact of, of uh, unemployment, and this is just one of the statistics. The direct cost to the federal government and lost tax revenue and increased expenditures for each 1% rise in unemployment is over 25 billion. And of course, when the deficit goes up, so do the interest rates, and that puts an additional burden on the economy. But these statistics on unemployment actually underestimate the problem because you have to add to the unemployment, which we have right now, the almost 10%. The 5.8 million involuntary part-time workers, or at, they're at a record high too, 1.2 million. And also add the record number of discouraged workers, 10.8 million. So you actually get a grand total of unemployed or partly employed, 17.8 million or 16.2%. Now if you also compare this with the Great Depression, and to count in the factor of the millions of people who are in the armed forces or working for the government in relationship to defense, take them out of it and put them on the unemployed rolls like they were back in 1929, we actually would have an unemployment rate, a rate much more severe than of the Great Depression. It even gets worse when you talk about individuals. They've found now that each percentage point of increase of unemployment sustained over five years provides a 4.1 increase in suicides, 4.3% increase among men, 2.3 among women, in first-time admissions to state mental hospitals, 1.9% increase in deaths from disease, an increase of 4% in prison admissions, 5.7% increase in homicides. And of course, kids who don't get jobs during the summer are more likely to turn to crime to make ends meet. So everything isn't just the cold heart. Well, today, friends, the unemployment rate rose up almost to 10%. People are hurting. Some people are not, though. Some people are not. In fact, while a lot of people are hurting for the unemployment and the poor are getting poorer under Reaganomics, the rich are getting richer. Forbes magazine advertises itself on television as a capitalist tool that will help young executives get the skills and the information they need to help them in their climb up the corporate ladder. And every year they they publish the salaries of the highest 20 corporate executives. And the winner this year, folks, was the president of Warner's Communication, who came in for a cool $27.5 million a year. They also listed the next person, who was $7.5 million a year, also a corporate executive of a communications empire, and then listed the next 20 corporate executives, all of whom made over a million dollars a year. Missing for the first time from the top 20 were corporation executives from the automobile, the steel, or the manufacturing industries, which evidently aren't doing so well under today's economy. In fact, Craig, you have some information that small business, like the poor and the unemployed, are suffering the age of Reaganomics. Right, and not so small necessarily. I like to call this little bit of commentary, still we got fun. <laughs> yes, folks, it's time once again to ask, how's business? Not so good, to put it in a nutshell. But if you've been following the annex of the Reagan team, you know it's not their fault. When inflation dips below the double-digit level, it's because Reaganomics is taking hold. But when leading economic indicators continue to shrivel and die on the vine, then of course, 
It's the business blight brought on by that old peanut farmer, Jimmy Carter, lingering on. You might say that politicians in general can display an amazing flexibility in some matters, particularly when relating to interim elections. Well, the lingering effects of peanut policy this time has led to a virtual epidemic of bankruptcies. The Wall Street Journal reports a post-depression high in the percentage of failing firms. For the first three months of this year, an average of 36 businesses per hour have gone belly up, an increase from last year of 29%. At that pace, nearly 75,000 companies will go bankrupt this year, a new American record. Now, these aren't just your family-run shoestring organizations either. Braniff Airlines, for one, went down in flames recently, and indications are that International Harvester may soon join the scrap heap. With revenues last year of over $7 billion, International Harvester would be the largest U.S. company ever to file bankruptcy. At least for the time being, that is. Edward Altman, the chairman of the MBA program at New York University, estimates that 200 of the biggest 2,000 industrial concerns now teeter on the brink of collapse. Well, inevitably, the big losers when a company folds are the workers. Four out of five bankruptcy filings are for straight liquidation, as in, that's all she wrote. In the trucking industry, for example, 144 companies have gone under since mid-1980, at the cost of over 28,000 jobs. But that's not the worst of it. Consider the plight of hundreds of West Virginia coal miners who were stuck with unpaid medical bills when their employers went bankrupt without having paid the insurance premiums. What a nice surprise. The big winners in bankruptcy, naturally, are lawyers, accountants, and bankers. That's when the loot's all divvied up. Particularly since the 1979 revision of the bankruptcy code eliminated the requirement that, quote, a spirit of economy prevail when bankruptcy lawyers set their fees. As might be expected, the hogs are hunkering down to the old trough. In Miami, for instance, a lawyer in a bankruptcy proceeding for the GAC Corporation sought court approval for a fee, and you're going to love this, for $210 an hour for 7,000 hours of work, or a cool $1.5 million for a half a year's job. The judge settled a paltry $650,000 on him. You know, friends, maybe we were all in the wrong line of work. And with all this talk of bankruptcy and depression, I thought I was making the shrewd move, socking my money into apples and pencils. <laughs> well, I have a story here on the tragedy of dolphins around the world, particularly in Japan. This was provided by the Greenpeace people. Well. In the spring of 1980, Japanese fishermen began slaughtering dolphins off of Iki Island. They thought then that the dolphins were stealing their catch, refusing to acknowledge the fact that overfishing and heavy coastal pollution by man really bore much of the blame, the real blame. Dolphins, just by the hundreds, lie dead along the beaches of Iki Island in, by Japan, just waiting to be processed into fertilizer. The Japanese fishermen plan to continue this slaughter, and they will unless worldwide pressure is put on them. And this is the, what the Greenpeace people are trying to do. Worldwide, thousands of dolphins are being killed every year by Americans, Japanese, Turks, Peruvians. Man's war against the dolphins doesn't have any boundaries at all. In the United States alone, the government allows the killing of 31,000 dolphins a year by American tuna boats. So how do these um, wonderful, amazing, fun-loving, gentle animals end? Ground into fertilizer. The consequence of man's unthinking and unfeeling relation to the earth and his fellow creatures.
Let's focus on one of the current and most spectacular revelations that the CIA has made in recent years, and that is their expose of Nicaragua that was just yesterday, the day before we're taping this, where a Department of Defense personnel and a CIA director, Bobby Inman, yes. I think it was, claimed to have photographs that showed that Nicaragua was greatly increasing their military forces, that it was on the same model as Cuba's, that this was all being funded by the Soviet Union, that Nicaragua was systematically carrying out genocidal operations against Indian tribes living in Nicaragua. They had pictures of villages that had been uh, destroyed. What would your attitude towards this be? I think the first time that I can remember since the Bay of Pigs that a single, uh, there may have been one other case, but it's, it's almost the only case since then that the CIA uh, or U.S. intelligence has disclosed satellite data wh from which they say this came. Uh, now, satellite data, by its very nature, and depending on how far they enlarge it, uh, can be made to prove anything. Uh, these pictures, I'm not saying, I do not know, I have not seen the pictures, but uh, we are asked to believe that these picture pictures were taken within the last several months uh, in Nicaragua or over Nicaragua by U.S. satellites. We are further asked to believe that uh, the, the uh, activity which is portrayed in these pictures uh, is taking place as of now. Uh, recently, uh, Secretary Haig said, and he held it up as, as, as the smoking gun in a press conference, that uh, his information was that the Nicaraguan government was engaged in uh, massive repression against the Mosquito Indians. Right. That was the big and point they made again yesterday with these pictures of burned out villages. Well, uh, one of those, the picture to which Secretary Haig referred to mm -hmm. in his press conference uh, 10 days ago uh, was a picture which was published in Le Figaro magazine in, in Paris. And uh, it later turned out that that picture had been published with a caption saying that this was the, Nicarag the present Nicaraguan government uh, showing them burning houses and burning people alive, I believe. Uh, it turned out that that picture, and Le Figaro has admitted it since then, mm -hmm. uh, was a picture that was taken uh, during the Somoza rule, and that the, those pictures uh, were five, four or five years old. Uh, and, of course, uh, Mr. Haig has had to, uh, or General Haig has had to uh, pull back on that one, but they are now still saying that there is massive repression against the Mosquito Indians. I would simply point out that uh, uh, it's a dichotomy and a, a contradiction for this government to uh, give a great deal of attention to the human rights of mosquitoes if, in fact, these abuses are taking place uh, when, in fact, uh, Native Americans are not accorded the same attention by our government. Nor are the El Salvadorian right. people who are systematically being killed by these death squads. That are and the Guatemalan Indians uh, are being almost annihilated. It's almost a genocidal campaign by the Guatemalan government against the Indians in Guatemala. Uh, I do hope that uh, some of this, well, first of all, there is a, a lot of evidence coming out that the uh, part of the campaign by the CIA against Nicaragua is, in, is through paramilitary units and squads of Somos, former Somosista soldiers who are being trained in Honduras and their campaign is against these Mosquito Indians and a lot of hundreds of Mosquitoes have been killed by those squads have been cross-border raids. Uh, one of the uh, reasons why uh, that the Nicaraguan government has been forced I believe by these campaigns to to move uh, a lot of these people away from the areas where they're in danger is because of those activities, not because of a policy of the Nicaraguan right. government. It's as a result what of would their reason the US. be to have genocide against these tribes, the current government in Nicaragua? The State Department hasn't given any hypotheses about why they would be engaging in this. I can't see any motive for it. Yeah, it seems strange. Well, they, they pretend and would have us believe that the Nicaraguan government is, uh, is a totalitarian, one-party uh, top-down dictatorial rule and that they have no uh, wish to integrate the Mosquito Indians into into their into a society into their society and that furthermore they uh, have us believe that the Mosquitoes want to secede or mm -hmm. want to have an independent 
uh, country or a state or at least an area which they can call a separate country. I don't think there's any evidence to show that that's uh, what the Mosquito Indians wish. John, since the time we did that interview with Lewis Wolf, there's been quite a few revelations about CIA covert operations in Nicaragua. Can you comment on those? I think there were some stories in, in these times about some of the things that the CIA was up to there. I can comment in a speculative way since I, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm an analyzing the news now based on my past experience, of course. But uh, let's see, what's the inflation rate since uh, 1975 to 1982? In America? Yeah. What it's would that amount probably, to? Five years? It's, it's uh, been about 10% a year. But almost. Even more. The, the point is that the CIA's budget, it's been announced that the, the CIA, the president signed an order on the 1st of December ordering the CIA into full paramilitary covert action against Nicaragua from Honduras, organizing mercenaries to destabilize the countryside, to counter the Cuban aggression in that country, is uh, what, what they announced was the justification. And um, the budget they were given was 19 million. I compare that with the 14 million that I was given in 1975 in Angola. In Ang for the Angolan operation. The parallels are quite striking. You know, there were parallels with the Angolan operation in the Bay of Pigs, uh, for example, and other covert actions. But then Guatemala was different and Iran was different. So, you know, each, one, each situation is different. But here, we have so, it's so close. They're working from Honduras. We were working from Zaire and Kinshasa. Uh, they're working with uh, ex-Samosists. Uh, we were working with the Portuguese exiles, the Portuguese who had fled, for example, creating an army out of these people. Also, they have, uh, quote, mercenaries, uh, but actually soldiers who were sent from uh, Argentina, for example, and uh, Venezuela and Chile and Colombia. Uh, to to join this force, we had people coming from various places, from France, for example, and of course the South African force. They're functioning. Uh, the, 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 I could I could map out the the office for you, the program, the international program. Some things that I would observe if you've read my book is that such an operation is global. The commander would not be sitting in Honduras running the thing. The commander of the Nicaraguan task force will be in Washington. He will be sending agents uh, all around the world coordinating different aspects of this thing. They'll be sending cables to every station in the world advising the chief of station what his activities should be vis-a-vis -vis the local police and the local president and the local press to create an atmosphere supporting to the greatest extent possible what they're doing seeking arms that aren't attributable, seeking sources of news comments and releases that can be uh, put together in white papers to, to persuade. And then the bottom line that the justification Reagan has given and the CIA have given for doing this intervention is to counter the Cuban activities in Nicaragua. But see, the point is that they're not going to be any Cubans die in this thing. There, I believe there, it's said that there are 2,000 Cubans in Nicaragua now. They're functioning to help build an airport and no doubt military uh, advising, although I've, I've not seen that confirmed anywhere. A lot of doctors, medical personnel. Uh, uh, doctors and medical personnel and teachers and whatnot. And uh, from Italy and several other countries as well. It's not just Cubans that oh, have indeed. Oh, indeed. to uh, Nicaragua, but a variety of countries. The Nicaraguan sent. arms, it's been shown, are not coming from the Soviet Union. They're buying them from France and Italy right. and, and all kinds of other places. Or are they coming from, from, uh, from Cuba? This has been proven. By it. But uh, the point is that this program of the CIA is not going to be killing Cubans. Uh, it's going to be killing Nicaraguans. It's not going to be killing Nicaraguan officials, not that many Nicaraguan soldiers. It's going to be destabilizing the countryside, blowing up bridges, ambushing bush buses. Uh, if they follow the pattern that they have in other places, there'll be some schools bombed and marketplaces bombed to destabilize the economy so it can't function, so the network and fabric of society will break down. They kill village leaders. I've read they articles kill about that. The Phoenix program being duplicated, killing village leaders, hauling people out and executing them to terrorize them from, 
from cooperating with the government. And their families. And, and their families. In fact, and, um, the last three weeks in these times has had some very good articles on Nicaragua that indicates that from Honduras, some hit squads were sent into Nicaragua that have killed at least 30 leaders and just innocent people in mm -hmm. that region and have terrorized peasants and people living in Nicaragua near the Honduras border because of these hit raids, although on the other hand, they've led these people to organize and become even more firm and resolute in their will to protect their country. So sometimes these destabilization programs backfire and end up stabilizing the country, well, and unifying it, it them. It certainly did in the Bay of Pigs. The CIA invasion there unified Cuba under Fidel Castro. He came out of that thing ten times, a hundred times stronger than he was going into it. And, uh, and that probably will be an effect in Nicaragua. They, these Nicaraguans dying will be added to the 800,000 I mentioned earlier, the, the victims, people who die as, a direct, as direct victims of CIA covert actions in the last 30 years, the minimum figure given by all responsible parties and press and government studies and whatnot is 800,000. The figures range from 800,000 to a couple of million victims of CIA operations. Right. Indirect type of... Indirect. Mm -hmm. Now, that does not include, for example, the people who died in the Vietnam War, which was a direct result of a CIA covert action. Or the, what, million and, and a half in Indonesia? The million and a half in, in Indonesia. Now, that's, that's a lot of dead people. Now, the circumstances of this killing are pure terrorism recruiting terrorists to go across the port border and blow up and assassinate and kill. We have to remember that. The next time President Reagan or Alexander uh, The Hague uh, are making their pious statements about the threat of international terrorism and the horrors of international terrorism, the United States is, without any serious competition, leading the world in international terrorism today and for the past 30 years. John, isn't there something unique about this Nicaraguan situation is that the administration is openly admitting that they are carrying it on? That's truly a difference. And uh, this gets back to the rogue elephant. Is the CIA a rogue elephant or is it, has it all these years been doing what the president wants? And of course the truth is both. In some cases it's done what it wanted contrary to presidential orders. In other cases it's done what the president probably wanted but didn't say. In this case, because of the nature of the Secretary of State and the President, uh, the, the CIA is clearly doing exactly what the President wanted. Now, the, the President didn't hold a press conference to say, I'm sending in the CIA to kill people in Nicaragua, but uh, he, it, it has been admitted by the White House that they did. Uh, uh, it's been leaked and the President smiled at the leaks that uh, he did order the CIA into this action. So he's clearly, you know, he's, he sees himself as, uh, you know, Marshall Reagan, uh, uh, sort of, you know, showing off how he can shoot. You know, let those yeah. people know he's got, got something he can do. Lewis, while we're on Central America, we might also note that your group has published a book called White Paper, White Wash, in which you analyze the infamous white paper that was published by the American government to justify American intervention in El Salvador. Can you just briefly indicate some of the obvious whitewash in the white paper and some of the things published in your book and then maybe we can tell our audience where they can get this. The white paper was published uh, in 1979 by, by uh, uh, well, I should say, I'm sorry, there were prior indications of, of propaganda about U.S. intervention uh, in El Salvador, but the, the original white paper that we're talking about here came out in 1981, February, February 1981. And it was uh, said to have been captured, there are a series of documents that were captured by uh, the Salvadoran Armed Forces. Now, we should remember, first of all, that uh, there were three accounts offered as to how the information was captured. One said it was found by a State Department intelligence man who went to, to El Salvador and saw it on a table in the headquarters of the Salvadoran Armed Forces. A second account said that uh, it was found in what was called a safe house of the guerrillas in San Salvador. And the third and most unlikely account was that it was uh, uh, captured from a guerrilla who was found walking through the streets of El Salvador with a whole packet of uh, documents under his arm. 
Uh, each of those accounts were offered as uh, the source of, of these documents. Uh, we have analyzed uh, the documents that's in, a, in, a, in this book, uh, co-edited co by uh, Warner Pulchow, or edited by Warner Pulchow with interviews with Philip Agee. And uh, it's very interesting to analyze, as has been done in the book, line by line, word by word, the, the so-called white paper. Um, there are parts of the paper, for example, that refer to, in English, uh, sections of the so-called Spanish, original Spanish language documents that don't exist. Uh, there are... Creative translation. Exactly. There are, there's one document, for example, that's partly in Spanish, in handwritten Spanish, and then uh, uh, on the same document it's typewritten in English. Mm. So we're asked to believe that whomever was sitting down at the table writing these shopping list for arms from Cuba, from Vietnam, from Ethiopia, uh, where and Libya uh, was going to move from a pen in, in Spanish to a typewriter and type in English, uh, and very, I might say, very literal, very literary English. Uh, there are a lot of contradictions in the white paper. Basically, we should understand this because it was and is the, the first and, and the most important justification that has been used by the government for its uh, intervention in El Salvador. Of course, now they pretend that uh, because the white paper was so widely discredited, um, even by one of its authors who, who gave an interview to the Wall Street Journal and disclosed that uh, uh, he even had a lot of questions about it. <laughs> um, so I think there's a lot of reason that this document or this exercise in propaganda is a classic in CIA uh, propaganda. Lewis, if, if the audience wants to order this uh, book, how can they get it? Well, they can uh, write to uh, the publisher, which is Deep Cover Publications. Uh, should I give the yeah, uh, sure. address in, in Post Office Box 677, New York, New York 10013? And it's, uh, uh, well... 650 plus a dollar fifty yeah, handling. Yeah. And can people also get the mailing list for your other publications? You've published a book called Dirty Work, the CIA in Western Europe, and another one called Dirty Work, the CIA in Africa, as well as putting out this Covert Action Information Bulletin. Will you give information on how they can order that, uh, those other they publications? Can write, they can write to us, to Covert Action Information Bulletin in, in Washington. I'll, I'll give the address, okay. uh, uh, Post Office Box 50272, 50272, Washington, D.C., 2004 and we'll be happy to send you the, the information.